Hey guys, um, as you can see, my cat decided to be in my video at the beginning of it today. <laughs> I've been trying to get him down and he wouldn't get down. But he doesn't like people talking for some reason, so I figured once I got started, he'd be out of here. But we're going to uh, continue our Daniel study. I wasn't able to do it yesterday because I was immersed in taxes, and then I had a few more things to take care of for my dad uh, yesterday. So... Uh, we are in chapter one still, and, uh, you know, I've told how I started studying Daniel because I felt like I needed to stay the end times, and I was shocked at how marketplace-centered Daniel is, and so I've just been pulling nuggets out of there for all of you marketplace ministers, which, by the way, is 95% of the body of Christ, and if you work for a living, if you own a business, and you are a follower of Christ, and you are a marketplace minister. And that's where uh, the Lord is doing the most work in this day and hour, and really, if you look at the Bible throughout history. So we're at verse 17 of Daniel chapter 1, referring to Daniel and his friends, and this is after they passed the food test. And it says, God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom, and God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret meanings of visions and dreams. So the word or phrase, unusual aptitude, it's actually one Hebrew word, mata, and it means knowledge, thought. It refers to the ability to gain knowledge by study and also to its resulting acquisition. It's a use of practical knowledge for administering a government. So here's the thought that a person with an unusual aptitude is able to study a subject or a topic and through thinking about it, gaining that knowledge, they're able to gain even more knowledge as they study that topic and then they have results from it. So a lot of um, what I see, especially with people that are very much focused on personal and professional development, is the ability to gain knowledge is not the problem. The problem comes in translating that knowledge into beneficial results in your life. And I created a policy back in 2016 that I would not read a book, nor listen to a podcast, nor do an online course or any course for that matter without implementing what I gained or what I learned. And I had to implement that into my life. And that actually uh, has taken my business and my personal life to a whole other level. And the reason that was very important for me especially is I'm a learner, so I love learning for learning's sake, but I recognized I was gathering all of this knowledge and I wasn't applying it and seeing the results I wanted. And so for that reason, it's important that whatever you study, whatever knowledge you gain, it needs to translate into results in your life. So that's uh, what unusual aptitude is about, but also notice it's the use of practical knowledge for administrating a or administering a government. So what um, Nebuchadnezzar saw in these young men was their ability to rule, uh, to be leaders. And so they had a, a, an aptitude from the Lord of understanding. And uh, also that word understanding means, again, it's an action word. It's to act with insight, to act prudently, to give insight, to teach, to prosper, to consider, to ponder, to understand, to act prudently, and to act with devotion. So it's coupled with the unusual aptitude aspect in that they're, again, able to gain knowledge, uh, translate that into action steps, and that is a person who has understanding. And it's also the ability to see the Lord and what he's doing which I think is interesting because a lot of people walk around in life, a lot of Christ followers walk around in life and they have no idea what God's up to. They miss the things that he's saying and doing in society. And I think part of that problem is uh, because of the church mindset and that you're a very uh, active person in a church setting. You know, you sit in a chair, you may stand up for worship, you hear um, you're taught to, and then you're released and there's not an active participation uh, in the process. Well, because of relegating your Christian walk to just 
Sundays and Wednesdays or listening to a teaching or any other passive activity, a lot of times we don't also translate God into our everyday life. And so if you're a business owner, I have found that a lot of business owners have more uh, ability to see what God is up to in the business because quite frankly, we have to rely on him because if not, we'll probably sink the entire thing. So it's not really any indicator of intelligence as much as desperation. Of course, I'm being facetious, but there's a little bit of that in there. It's also walking in his ways. And then Jeremiah used this word for wisdom as far as insight and comprehension in Jeremiah 9, 24. It says, but those who wish to boast should boast in this alone, that they truly know me and understand that I am the Lord. And this is what they have to know about him who demonstrates unfailing love, who brings justice and righteousness to the earth and that he delights in these things. I, the Lord, have spoken. Now, I think that's interesting that the ability to truly know him and understand is in knowing and understanding that he is, he demonstrates unfailing love, um, bringing justice and righteousness to the earth. A lot of people know, and I'm sorry if you hear the sacks in the background, hopefully you don't, uh, but you know, I'm in a house and house things happen. Uh, but if you don't center justice and righteousness and his unfailing love, then God becomes just a judge waiting to squish you um, versus a loving father who actually wants to guide you away from any type of judgment or verdict against you that he would have to bring. And uh, so all business, all aspects of our life need to be centered in the fact that he is a God of who demonstrates unfailing love. And that's especially important when you're in the marketplace because the marketplace is both business and political and so, or governmental. And so when you're in the governmental aspect, and this is something that I have to really, really watch because I get so frustrated with lying and all kinds of stuff. Um, but the love is important when you're dealing, especially in politics, because people in politics, quite frankly, are sometimes just stupid and they do things to undermine the Constitution, they do things to undermine the Declaration of Independence, they do things to undermine our ability to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. And so because of that, it can cause anger because anytime you see injustice, anger is the usual response. So love is key in being effective and maintaining effectiveness and influence in the marketplace, whether it's business or politics or both. Now, understanding is also seen in keeping quiet in evil times. We do not know that, but um, I discovered that in my studies. And it's also tied to wisdom. Uh, in Psalm 94, 8, uh, well, actually, we could go up a little bit where it says in verse 4, How long will they speak with arrogance? How long will these evil people boast? They crush your people, Lord, hurting those you claim as your own. They kill widows and foreigners and murder orphans. And they say, the Lord isn't looking. And besides, the God of Israel doesn't care. Think again, you fools. When will you finally catch on? And so they need, fools need to pay attention and get wisdom and begin to understand that justice delayed doesn't mean justice is denied. And so um, we need to act with discretion and understanding that there is a God that if we continue on a path that is harmful to others and ourselves, then there will be uh, wages for that. And so the wise understand that. That's why wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord or reverence of the Lord, um, which I don't have time to dive into that, but it's an aspect that's actually the beginning of wisdom. So these boys, Daniel and his friends, excelled 10 times over everyone else, and they were able to study and draw the right conclusions. They were able to act with insight and discretion and to also give insight and teach others. And they were able to consider what was the best way to approach things and solve problems. And that is the epitome of having a business. A business is all about solving problems, whether through a service or through a product. Now, literature, they had to have um, a, an ability with literature. So let's go back to the Daniel 1, 17 real fast. Um, God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and then wisdom. So the word literature here is a document, writing, book, a scroll, letter with a message. Now it could also include like divorce decrees, um, proof of purchase deeds, book, book of laws, genealogical records, writing and language, really any governmental and business 
uh, document, these boys had an unusual aptitude for not only being able to read, which was probably not as common back then, but also the ability to understand what they were reading, which I'm sure legal documents aren't as ridiculously complicated as they are now, but still you have to have some, oh, here I am. Okay, I was gonna have to leave because it was like, hey, we're gonna hang up on you because we don't have a good signal. So they were able to read these legal documents and understand what they meant. Now, obviously Nebuchadnezzar would need these type of people to understand his kingdom, his culture, his laws, and then administer his government uh, as well. Now the word wisdom in verse 17 uh, is skill, experience, and shrewdness. Now again, wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. Uh, it originates in him. And the beginning of wisdom and life really is to properly fear and reverence, but also God gives us wisdom. Now, a lot of people don't recognize they're operating in wisdom when they're being creative. Uh, so one aspect of wisdom is creativity, craftsmen. And so it's not just arts and it's not just music. It's the, again, the ability to solve problems, but it's also any technical ability um, which, you know, goes beyond just being super, super smart and witty, but anything that's very practical in solving problems, innovating, ruling, and helping others. And so, for example, I'm very creative with branding. I'm very creative with websites. I'm creative with um, solving people's problems. So that's an aspect of wisdom. That's an aspect of being creative. So when you think of creativity, don't box yourself in um, with, well, I can't write, or I can't write music, or I can't paint. That is just one aspect of creativity. I'm sure if you are good at your job, you have some aspect of creativity and wisdom that's operating there. So any technical ability, um, it can be bookkeeping, it can be um, banking, it can be uh, insurance, it can be anything that is um, basically that you're good at, okay? Now these things are all given by God, uh, and here's the deal, none of them are related to IQ. So that's interesting. Now there's a few Hebrew words that do refer to intelligence, but all of these words do not ref ref uh, refer to intelligence. So it's like you have a natural ability that God gives you to learn, to study, blah, blah, blah. But in this case, God gave them a supernatural um, aptitude. And we want to access that. Every Christian can access that. And the ability to gain knowledge through study begins with the study of the word and also your technical abilities and where you want to improve when it comes to that skill. But also the Proverbs. I mean, the Proverbs are full of wisdom. I mean, like I said at the beginning of this series, I have studied the book of Proverbs for years now. I cannot get out of it. And it has actually saved me a lot of money. It has saved me a lot of time and it saved me even health issues. And so wisdom is so key and everyone can get wisdom uh, from God. And also I study other topics within my um, industry and my, my uh, technical ability. So I've even heard stories of people that became Christians that through the study of the word, uh, especially the epistles, they actually increase their IQ. I don't remember this one guy's name. Sesame is really, really good, and he's now a preacher, but his IQ when he uh, was a Christian, I think, was below normal. Um, I don't remember what it was, if it was like 68 or uh, 70 or something like that. But as he studied the Word, and he learned uh, God and, and different things. It's now, I don't know if he's genius or if he's above average. But anyway, it's just neat hearing his testimony. So basically, God makes you smart. That's, you know, it's just the way it is. Now, a continued reverence of the Lord will keep wisdom active. Um, so you might have natural abilities. You might have mediocre abilities. None of, that, none of that matters. If God supernaturally touches those things, it will cause and it will accelerate your success. In Job 32, 8, it says, But there is a spirit within people, the breath of the Almighty within them, that makes them intelligent. And uh, so the Holy Spirit is a true source of intelligence. And then you add to that by studying and gaining knowledge. Now, God gave Daniel um, the unusual ability to interpret uh, dreams. So we have visions and dreams here. Uh, the, it's also special ability. And that word means to interpret dreams and visions. But the word special 
is a part of, uh, I don't know if it's a particle or participle. Particle doesn't sound right. But anyway, it means each, every, all, everything, whole, and entire. So what that means is that Daniel um, had the ability to interpret all kinds of visions and dreams. Now, this gifting would literally save lives, you know, so I love this idea. I mean, if you think about it, your natural skill sets, your natural abilities infused with the supernatural uh, aptitude and intelligence of God can actually save people's lives. So don't underestimate your role in the marketplace, your role in the world, your role in the lives of others. Those things he's given you can be life and death for some people. And we shouldn't um, compare ourselves with others and then underestimate or hold ours in lighter esteem. We should recognize we all have different gift sets. We all have different abilities and skill sets that God gives us. And that because he gave them to us, that means they serve a purpose that we as a unique human being can fulfill only in a specific way because there's no one else like us. So don't ever underestimate your ability. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so don't downplay, don't dismiss what he's given you for his service or filter it through the church's idea of what ministry is or isn't. Um, unfortunately, people relegate ministry within four walls of a church. And like I said, 95% of ministers are in the marketplace. So you can just throw that business out immediately. Okay, so uh, verses 18 through 21. When the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all of the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. Whenever the king consulted in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. Daniel remained in royal service until the first year of the reign of King Cyrus. Okay, so every ruler needs and should have a council of advisors, but only wise rulers have good ones, great ones. So Nebuchadnezzar recognized the great ones and Daniel and his friends, and so he consulted them whenever he need, needed them. Now, of course, I'm sure he had other, you know, men that also were wise, but he recognized that these young men were 10 times more capable in any manner requiring wisdom and balanced judgment. Now, wisdom is the same word we've already examined, but balanced judgment is interesting. It's understanding, comprehension, discernment, and righteous action. But in nearly all of the literary contexts in the Bible uh, of this word, it carries a strong moral connotation. So it's a byproduct of understanding God's desires. And in fact, those who didn't have it actually resulted in sin and could even drive away God's compassion for them uh, and those that could possibly be under uh, their care or that served with them. Now, balanced judgment can also be acquired and increased like understanding and aptitude and wisdom. But what this means in the context of Nebuchadnezzar is that their counsel was based on righteousness because they knew God, that it was morally right, and Nebuchadnezzar loved it. He liked it. So he, unlike political leaders today, recognized sound judgment in spite of being a pagan. Now, the word magician is an engraver, a writer associated with the occult. These people seem to have had knowledge of astrology or divination and were commonly associated with magicians in Egypt of Pharaoh's court. The word enchanters is conjurers of spirits, necromancers or astrologers. The wisdom of God will always outshine any demonic realm or wisdom that darkness has. So his wisdom, his balanced judgment is no match for the kingdom of darkness, implying that we as believers in the marketplace should be the most wise, the most balanced, and the most sought after over any other religious or pagan background. Okay. Now, in 1 Kings 3.28, it says, When all Israel heard the king's decision, the people were awe in awe of the king, for they saw the wisdom of God, had the wisdom God had given him for rendering justice. And then Proverbs 29.2 says, When the godly are in authority, the people rejoice. So wisdom is needed for rendering justice, but when the wicked are in power, the people groan. 
So wisdom is seen in how people rule. Godly, just, and righteous wisdom equals godly rule, and godly rule equals equal justice for all. Now, there's not, uh, when you have equal justice, there's no bias based on your financial ability, whether you're a lead or not, political points, skin color, financial status, none of that is a factor. Wisdom is equal justice for all. So the reason the people groan when the wicked are in power is because justice is perverted, sometimes eliminated, and then it causes a breakdown in society, chaos, and violence. And so typically the tables are turned where the poor and the disadvantaged suffer, or it can be the poor and disadvantaged are used as a pawn and people that are of a different political affiliation or that are wealthy are then gone after. So we see that with the end of the czars in Russia and the beginning of uh, communism there. We see it in Venezuela. We see it with Hitler and what he did to the wealthy and the powerful. And his message was for the poor and the uh, underprivileged. And they didn't recognize they were being fed a line of poison. And they actually turned against their leaders. Same thing in Russia, same things in Venezuela, same things in Cuba. Don't worry, we'll get, you'll always have food in your belly. You'll always have a place to sleep. Just give up your rights and we will take care of all those things. And so a lot of times the poor believe that message because they're desperate for comfort and they're desperate for stability. And so when they realize that they've been had, it's too late. The people are in power and that's why we have to protect our countries from such things. Now, here's what's very interesting about the phrase in authority. It's a verb that means to be many or to become many, to be abundant, and it means to become numerous or great. It expresses God's original mandate for humans to multiply on the earth. It's not just one ruler, but an abundance of godly, demanding justice and righteousness in their cities, counties, states, and country. In fact, an abundance, those that are we the people, we are actually the ones in authority, despite what people try to say as far as the federal government and the supremacy clause, we are the ones with the authority. So when the abundance of the godly can pressure, um, or they have the ability to pressure even ungodly rulers, or at least curb their wickedness. And so that's why it's so important for Christ followers to be engaged in the marketplace, both business and uh, politics. And Daniel, Daniel is a great example of this. Because of his, him and his friends, um, and they were more capable than all of Nebuchadnezzar's magician and, and enchanters, they actually helped cause him to make better decisions than he probably would have made without them. So he didn't always make the best, but we do see in the story of Daniel and Babylon that his wickedness was curbed to a large degree because of Daniel and his friend's influence. So the writer of Daniel wants us to understand the faithfulness and stability of Daniel by revealing that he remained faithful all the way up to Cyrus. So he gave 60 years of service through different rulers, some good, some bad, some in between. But God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His principles and attributes are eternal and apply to every generation. He nor his ways are subject to society's whims, culture, or the desire to remove God completely. He will never be defeated. He will never be diminished. So the question is, how will you use your skill set, your talents, the God-given uh, unusual aptitude he's given you to influence those in the marketplace, uh, government and business, and to even curb wicked rulers' decisions or eliminate bad ones altogether? So that's the question, and that's the influence that you can have.